call uh, for that as well. Uh, that might be a little more conducive to people coming in than having to traipse through uh, uh, through the worship center here. So, um, as as our need changes, we will uh, we'll continue to make some adjustments here. Uh, so anyway, I just want to let you know that, and to, I'll say it was the case for all my preacher friends. Last Sunday was their biggest Sunday in months. I don't know what it was specially about it, but uh, it was uh, was good for all of us to uh, to see the the church uh, a little more uh, filled up last weekend. So, good job. <clears throat> You just say the word, Ken. I'm on now. I I can't really see that. Between the glasses and the weird lights, all I see is a vague shadow of uh, the projection guy back there. All right, well, hi, my name is James Sayers. I'm the pastor here at Roy Christian Church. And we just want to, uh, on on behalf of the whole church family, say welcome. Uh, We're glad to have you with us. Um, we, uh, we pray as always that, um, while you're here, that you'll be challenged, that you will be built up in your faith. Um, that's always our hope. If this is your first time with us, uh, we'd uh, like to get to know each other a little bit better. So meet me out at the fireplace table here, um, when the service is finished up this morning. Uh, I've got a gift for you just for being here to say thank you, uh, and, uh, to, to try to get to know each other a little bit better. I hope you will stop by this morning before you go. <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we have our text line number. If you haven't added that to your phone contacts yet, we hope you'll do that. Uh, the number is 385-217-8399. It's right there on the screen behind me. And then you can text one of four keywords to that number. <clears throat> Online is for our digital congregation out there, the virtual church. Uh, Loop is for the people who are uh, count this as their church home and want to be made aware of updates and reminders. Hello is for our new friends um, that are just getting to know us. And then we have one set up for our youth group as well, middle and high school students. Uh, you'll text the word youth to us. Uh, we'll make sure you get on the list. We do have some things coming up in the next few weeks we don't want you to miss. Uh, when you text those keywords, you'll be prompted um, to fill in some information. Let me thank you in advance for going ahead and filling out that information for us. <clears throat> I will say that if you're watching online, we want to know that you're there. Um, you know, when we when we started all of this back in March and April of last year, uh, there were some Sundays we'd have well over a couple hundred people. A few Sundays, even more, like 400 people would would stop by for a few minutes during our live stream. Um, But we usually only have a handful that let us know that they're there. So please, I'm I'm begging you, uh, let me know that you're there, uh, where you're watching from, uh, and how things are in your world. Uh, Even if you're here in the room this morning, uh, be sure to give a uh, uh, howdy to your your fellow church uh, friends. If you go to our website, roychristian.org, you can do all kinds of things there. Uh, subscribe to our electronic newsletter. Check our event calendar, which is updated weekly. You can share a prayer request, and you can also view and download our weekly bulletin. So we hope you'll stop by there. Uh, I do want to remind everybody who is a part of the leadership team, that's elders, trustees, ministry leaders, and staff, that we have a meeting today at 4 o'clock uh, back in the large classroom. Uh, And then the elders will meet um, in a separate session afterward uh, whenever that occurs, 5.30, 5.45, or 6 o'clock, somewhere in there. So please, uh, if you're part of that group, please plan to attend. Uh, In the last week, we've had several prayer requests come through the chain. And many of them have been pretty pretty significant requests. So... uh, I'm not going to go over all of them. Many of them are listed on your bulletin. They are uh, requests that have come through the prayer chain in the last uh, in the last week, even uh, last night and this morning. So uh, please uh, be aware of those things. Please keep praying for them. Uh, there are are some, as I said, some pretty serious things going on uh, for some of our friends and and uh, and family. Uh, let's take a moment to pray together. About, uh, about all those kind of things that are on our heart and on our mind uh, and ask God to be with us this morning as we worship. Let's pray. Father, it is a privilege to uh, be together here 
uh, to come to a place that is safe and comfortable, uh, that's, uh, that's convenient for us. It's, it's all the things that we would hope for, um, but we know that's not really the reason that we come, just to have a pretty place and a nice place uh, to get together. Uh, we're here to worship you, to lift you up, um, to, to stand in testimony of the faithfulness that you have exhibited to us uh, in this last week. We're so very thankful, Father, that we have a chance to come to you and to pray, uh, to, uh, to lift up all kinds of requests and pr uh, prayers to you. Uh, we know that as a good father, as a capable father, that you, you hear each one and you begin to answer them as well. Uh, Lord, for these friends that we have uh, been praying for this last week, um, for, uh, for those who have experienced uh, the loss of a loved one, um, for people in the midst of some other sort of family crisis or struggle, um, for people who are recovering from surgery or anticipating uh, therapy, uh, Lord, we pray that you would just wrap your big, powerful, loving arms around them, that you would hold them close, uh, and that they would feel um, the comfort and strength and healing that only you can bring. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, uh, for the opportunity we have uh, to crawl into our Father's lap, um, to lean back on uh, on His chest, and to tell Him all the things uh, that that we're concerned about. We know that our Father, that You, Lord, know everything already, uh, but You want to hear from us. You want us to pray. Uh, you want us to be in conversation with You. So thank You for inviting us into this relationship. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I do want to remind you that uh, if you would like to make a gift to the church this morning, that you can do that through the basket in the foyer. Uh, there is a link on the website, or you can set up a funds transfer through your uh, financial institution. Uh, we are very appreciative of the incredible giving that we have experienced in the last few weeks. Thank you so much for uh, your generous uh, sharing in God's kingdom uh, and uh, and partnering with him in the work of spreading his good news every place. Uh, thank you so much for giving and worshiping uh, with us this morning. Um, <clears throat> if it weren't for the, uh, the intricacies of technology and trying to figure out how to make things work in more than one place at the same time, uh, I, I would have shown a little bit of a clip this morning from a guy named Tim Hawkins. Um, some of you know who Tim Hawkins is. He's a, a comedian who happens to be a Christian, very funny, pretty spazzy and bizarro uh, most of the time. Uh, but one of my favorite bits that he does uh, has to do with, uh, with your hands in church. Maybe you've seen it online. Uh, he's got this this whole uh, this whole uh, bit about how how people raise their hands or not in church. Um, we you know we don't have any specific position on that, and so sometimes we have some people who raise their hands as they as they pray or as they worship, and that is really okay. Um, I'm not going to make you do it. I'm not going to tell you you can't do it. Um, just as long as you're not trying to wave in aircraft from the airport over there. Uh, that's, that's really all my, my biggest concern is. Uh, but he, he talks about what these various poses are, various positions of, of hands in worship. And he, uh, here are the names of them. He calls the first one the carry the TV, where you just kind of have your hands down in front of you like you're carrying the TV. And if you're really into it, you carry the big screen, raising your hands to God. Uh, he also talks about those people who, uh, it's the, my fish was this big, or the people who are liars, my fish was, was this big. Uh, he talks about um, the, that some people in church, that they hold the baby, hold my baby, would you please hold my baby, please, I'm begging you, hold my baby. Uh, and then there's one that is um, the dueling light bulbs, switching back and forth. Uh, and then uh, all of us have seen the, the goalposts, uh, and then sometimes goalposts turn into a heartburn. Some of you know that. Uh, and then uh, I think my absolute favorite is the Mufasa uh, from Lion King. And then he says that many, many women seem to really enjoy wash the window, wash, wash the window back and forth. 
Uh, my goal is not to convince you or to persuade you that you should be doing any of those in worship, but you can if, if you want to. Um, my, my bigger concern is, uh, is what we're doing with those hands, not just in, in worship. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul writes, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. And you may say, wow, that is a weird random verse for James to focus on. But remember, um, we started last week looking at holiness. The, the key verse for this is back in uh, 1 Peter 1. Uh, be holy, therefore, as God is holy. God is holy. He has, he has called and invited us, and so we will be holy. That was last week's sermon. Okay, so we're still focusing on the holiness of God and the holiness that ought to follow in us as well. So I, I guess I'll ask you the question, when was the last time that you thought about having holy hands? In the Bible, there are more than 100 references to lifting up hands and spreading out hands in prayer to God. Now, I can probably count on uh, one hand the number of times in the last year that I have seen anybody lift up or, ra or spread out their hands in prayer when the body of Christ has gotten together. But it's right there in the Bible. Moses uh, spread out his hands in prayer in Exodus 9, verse 29. David sang in Psalm 28, verse 2, Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. Solomon knelt and spread out his hands in prayer to God. I would do that, but you don't want to hear that crunching as I bend. Uh, Solomon knelt in front of the, of the temple and spread out his hands in prayer uh, to God. That's in 1 Kings 8, uh, verses 22 and verse 54. And in that same passage, uh, a parallel passage, he expects that Israel will do the same thing as they share every plea and every prayer with their Father in heaven. In despair and shame over Israel's sin, the priest Ezra fell to his knees and spread out his hands to God in Ezra 9.5. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like because it might mean a little bit different each way that you hold your hands. You know, how does a toddler reach out their hands to their parent? They, they want to be picked up. They want to be embraced. Sometimes... We, we're, we're praying like this with our hands wide open that something will, will land in those hands. Sometimes we, uh, it, it's urgent. We're just reaching out for anybody who will grab anything. It, it probably does mean a little bit of something. I don't know for each of these people if, if they had a different hand position. We shouldn't get too worked up about that. The idea, though, is that when they prayed to God that they lifted up their hands they spread out their hands in prayer to him. It seems like for Paul that it is a given that God's people will pray. He, he doesn't say, I want people everywhere to pray, to remind them that they need to do that. The understanding is they are going to pray, but when they do it, he would like for them to lift up holy hands in prayer. The focus is not on reminding them to pray, but reminding them what it is that they're doing as they pray. They're lifting up holy hands. The emphasis is not necessarily the position of the hands, you know, the lying fish or the Mufasa or any of those things. The emphasis is on the condition of the hands that are being raised up to God. Let me read it again. I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without prayer or disputing. The hands are supposed to be holy. I want the men everywhere to lift up holy hands. Now, in, um, during biblical times, the Jews actually would go and wash their hands before prayer. The hands are supposed to be cleaned. They're, they're consecrated then for whatever is about to follow. 
in our day and time, we totally get the hand washing, sanitizing thing. We all know that we're supposed to be washing our hands all the time now. But in, in the time of Jesus and before, back to the time of Solomon and David and Moses, hands were washed before prayer. Now, Paul is not saying here that everybody needs to wash their hands before they pray in church. <clears throat> that may be a part of it, but that's not all of it. Holy hands are not just scrubbed and sanitized for 20 seconds, okay? They are hands that are given to God's work and hands that are not given to selfish desires and sin. That's what makes them holy. They are all about God's purposes and God's will. Not just that they've been dunked in sanitizing solution. Clean, godly hearts direct the actions of those holy hands. In James verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Come near to God, and He will come near to you. And then He says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay? What two things go together there? Washing of the hands and the cleansing of the heart. Now it is holy. It's been set aside for God's purposes. We come near to him. He comes near to us. Uh, one of the Bible commentators uh, wrote about this passage, First. Uh, Timothy 2.8, that a foul hand, dirty hand, an unholy hand, gets nothing from God. How can it? God's best gift is of such a sort as cannot be laid upon a dirty palm. A little sin dams back the whole of God's grace. And there are too many men that pray, 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 and never get any of the things that they pray for because there is something stopping the pipe. And they do not know what it is. And perhaps would be very sorry to clear it out if they did. But all the same, that channel of communication is blocked and stopped. And it is impossible that any blessing should come. Some of us have, uh, have growing, unchecked, and unnoticed in the innermost channels of our hearts little sins that mat themselves together. And keep increasing until the grace of God is utterly kept from permeating the parched recesses of our spirits. And Paul says, I would that man would pray lifting up holy hands. And unless we do, alas for us. You get that illustration? God's pipe of blessing is aimed right at us. And we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing comes through that pipe because little sin and little sin and little sin and little sin has, has woven itself together and clogged the flow of God's blessings to us. And it doesn't matter how hard we pray until that sin is dealt with, until we have clean hearts and holy hands again, those prayers are not going to be answered. Holy hands raised up to God in prayer. That's what Paul is looking for. Now, he gives a couple of uh, conditions about those holy praying hands. They're supposed to be hands of peace, both hands of peace with others and hands of peace with God. Uh, here's a good question for you. Can angry hands also be holy hands? Can angry hands be holy hands? Again, uh, some Bible commentator has said, an angry man is a very unfit man to pray. And a man who cherishes in his heart any feelings of that nature towards anybody may be quite sure that he is thereby shutting himself out from blessings which otherwise might be his. Can an can angry hands be holy hands? Uh, 
I think that anger and rage and wrath are usually about us, aren't they? They're about our own agendas, our own preferences, our own our own perspectives on things. Anger is about taking matter into our own hands rather than leaving those matters in God's very capable hands. Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount that we should, uh, we should deal with any kind of broken feelings, whether it is um, anger or rage or wrath, um, some kind of dissension or division between uh, brothers and sisters, those things should be dealt with quickly before somebody would go into worship. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23, 24, and 25. Jesus says to reconcile matters quickly, to settle matters quickly. It will only get worse if you don't. And I would point out what Jesus says there, that reconciling and forgiving are absolutely essential for God's praying people. Paul says, lift up holy hands. Well, they can't be angry hands or holding a grudge or bitterness or some other sort of negative feelings toward another person. But they're also supposed to be holy hands that are at peace with God as well. So I ask this question. Can disputing questioning hands be holy hands. What Paul is talking about there probably is intellectual rebellion against God. I'm, I'm saying in my mind, I'm not sure I agree with his plan. I don't like where God is headed with this. And so I'm just going to call that into question. I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm going to need to meditate on that for a little bit because I think that God is wrong. You may not have used those exact words, but you have probably had similar thoughts. I know for sure some of you have. Well, you feel like that God is, is asking me to do this or that in the church? You believe that after months of praying that, that I've my name should be on a list to do this? Oh, I think you are sorely mistaken, James. That can't possibly be right. But aren't you disputing questioning with God. Doubting hands are not holy hands. Holy hands, again, remember that holiness has to do with being set apart, consecrated, dedicated for a specific purpose. How can you have hands that are set apart for God's purpose if you're not really sure you agree with that purpose? It is not our position, not our responsibility to second guess or to argue with God about what his purposes are for us. If, if forgiveness and reconciling are an essential part of being God's praying people, I think that faithful trust in his will is also essential to be one of God's praying people. We lift up holy hands in prayer without rage and anger, without doubts and questioning God. Now, I'm not saying that you, you are never allowed to have doubts about your faith. Uh, I, I don't know a believer who doesn't occasionally struggle with a little bit of doubt now and then. Sometimes those questions are very healthy. But when we get into an argument with God about what it is that we're supposed to do, you know, sort of like Moses did there back on the mountain, I want you to go and set my people free. Well, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I can't, I'm not, I'm not top good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not ready to do that. This would be a horrible mistake, God. What are you thinking? We need to trust that if God knows us and has planned us and designed us and created us with his purposes in mind, that when those purposes arrive, we're ready to go. We can trust him to carry us through. Now, I want, I want people everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. That's verse 8. But we kind of have to go back to the beginning of the chapter to see what it is we're supposed to be praying about. That's where Paul's discussion of prayer began. If we have holy hands that are lifted up in prayer and peace, then what is it that we are praying about? Verse 1. I urge then, first of all, 
that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What are we supposed to be praying about? If we're going to lift up holy hands in prayer, holy hands of peace, what do we pray for? I think Paul's got three, three quick instructions here. Number one, we need to pray for those in authority over us. And I'm not sure that there is any verse in all of Scripture right now that is more timely for us than that one. If you'd like less government, uh, sorry, uh, I, I know that I would like less government in my life. Um, I, I'd be very happy to know what happens in Washington every month or two, not every 20 minutes. But Romans 13 verses 1 and 2 tell us that there is no authority in place except that God has put that person in that position. Every authority that we know has been put there by God. I do have questions for God about some of that. God has appointed those rulers. So regardless of your party or your politics, what should you be doing? You should be praying for those who have authority over you and me. Outgoing, incoming, long-term, short-term, left aisle, right aisle. It doesn't matter. Now, it is obvious to me from my Facebook feed that I have dearly beloved friends and family at radically different ends of the political spectrum. Many of those people are believers in Jesus. And I hope that they are spending at least as much time praying for the politicians who are serving and leading us as they are complaining about all of that mess. We should be praying, raising up holy hands, in prayer, spreading out our hands for God to bless and guide and direct those who have authority over us. Now, part two of that. Paul says that we should pray that we may live peaceful, quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Now, as somebody who likes less government interference in my life, I definitely will pray that one-two punch. I'll pray for the president whoever that president is, and I will pray that they stay far away from me. <laughs> that they are not involved in my life very much. Because all of us really want quiet, peaceful lives. We, we seek that tranquility. And as God's people, we need to have lives that are not just peaceful and quiet and unbothered by Washington or the capital in our own state. We need to be focused on godliness and holiness. We pray for the king. We pray that we will live peaceful, quiet lives without government interference. And as so that prayer, I will pray for those leaders in the Capitol building um, so we can live peaceful lives. But also, we need to be praying to live a tranquil life of personal purity and piety, hope that's holiness, religious devotion, reverence, and respect for God. It's not enough for us to just pray that we'll have peaceful, quiet lives without any, any wild, scary times. We need to be focusing on our personal relationship with God, that we'll remain holy, righteous, dedicated to his purposes. Then the last part of, uh, of that paragraph is that we need to be praying 
uh, along with God's purposes, that all people would, would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That is God's ultimate will, right? People will be saved and come to a knowledge of God's truth. You know the verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. That's the purpose. That's the plan. That the whole world would come to believe that Jesus is God's son and the way to salvation. It is just that simple. This is not a complicated message. God loved the world. He sent his son to die in the world's place so that we could be with God forever. That's the message. So God's holy people ought to be raising up that prayer all the time. Lord, would you please work in my church? Would you work through my family? Would you work through me? Would you work through that organization, through that missionary, through that evangelist, through those small groups at church? Would you work through them to bring people to salvation and to have knowledge of God's truth? I have to be praying about people's hearts, that their minds and hearts would be changed in some way so that they would want to find God's truth Because repentance leads to a knowledge of God's truth. That's what 2 Timothy 2.25 says. And then knowing that truth will lead to godliness. That's Titus 1.1. We need to pray for soft, squishy hearts that are ready to find God's message, to believe that truth and that 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 knowledge would change their lives, knowing the truth about God's Son, Jesus. We left holy hands up in prayer that people will be saved, that they will come to a knowledge, the saving knowledge of God's truth. So let me ask you, for whom are you praying to find God's eternal rescue? Hopefully it's not just a generic thing like, God, please bring salvation to all the people that live in that country. I, I hope and pray that you're being very specific. For whom? Are you praying to find God's eternal rescue? He's the deliverer. Who are you praying that will be delivered by Jesus? See, praying like this, being very specific, naming people, pleases God. It is his plan, after all, to save. Paul says, I want want hands lifted up, holy hands. Hands set apart for God's purposes that are focused on peace. Peace with others and peace with God. To bring more people into that relationship of peace with God. I hope that you'll look at that verse again this week. And that every time you get ready to raise your hand somewhere, whether it's in in class or at a ball game or putting the cereal away in the pantry, whatever it is, that you will think about the holy nature of your hands. They are set apart for God's purposes. And I hope that right then in that moment, that as your hands are raised, that you will pray one of these prayers. And that brings us uh, then to the celebration of the Lord's Supper, Communion. Uh, so if I could get uh, a few men to come uh, and I put, uh, put gloves on and to serve uh, the congregation, please. If you're watching from home, if you'd go ahead and grab uh, your bread and, uh, and grape juice and have that ready, we'll all partake together in just a few moments. <clears throat> uh, my communion thoughts this morning are not original to me. I've uh, borrowed them um, from, uh, from a preacher uh, uh, who wrote an article in the Christian, uh, Christian Standard magazine. And I think it's especially fitting since this is uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend um, to focus a little bit on uh, what the good doctor had to say. On May 17th, 1956, um, I've got one here. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. joined other civil rights leaders at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. That day, he delivered a sermon entitled the death of evil upon the seashore. 
This event commemorated the second anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. King saw in minority groups' struggles for social equality in America uh, a parallel with Israel's bondage in Egypt. And just as God released Israel, King envisioned that God's goodness would deliver the United States from the evil of segregation. Midway through his sermon, uh, Dr. King spoke of Jesus' death on the cross to highlight a contrast. He said, Good Friday may occupy the throne for a day, but ultimately it must give way to the triumphant beat of the drums of Easter. Evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross, but one day that same Christ will rise up and split history into A.D. and B.C., so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. When Jesus' body was pierced, evil appeared to win the victory. In reality, Jesus' death and resurrection secured God's supreme victory over evil. John introduced his marvelous vision with words of praise for Jesus' sacrificial victory. These words provided the foundation for uh, King's eloquent contrast. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. The Apostle John made it clear that in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, God unleashed the ultimate weapon leading to the death of evil. Even today, God continues to demonstrate the eternal good of the cross. The body and blood of Jesus paid the penalty for all evil acts throughout human history. All. That body and blood hold the power to unite every believer, regardless of differences, into one kingdom as God's holy priests. As we partake of the loaf and cup, let's set aside the differences created by a sinful world. Let's unite with thanksgiving around the one whose death <clears throat> sets every uh, believer free. Jesus, the crucified Christ and victor over evil. Father, we thank you for the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We're grateful for the power that he displayed in those acts and for the eternal impact that it has on us, for the impact it has now on your children everywhere. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Matthew 26 gives us the account of the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave, his, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> Amen. My friends, I want to send you out uh, with uh, these words of the Apostle Paul from Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13 that you will learn the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, and that you will say, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. May God bless you and guide you this week as you love him and follow him. We'll say goodbye to our friends in the digital world uh, and welcome all of our friends here uh, in the conversation.